Well, it's uh, wonderful to be here, and I'm very grateful uh, for the inta invitation. I'm going to make a very brief introduction to someone who needs some introduction. Bill Cornish is going to talk about his time as director from its inception until 1994, and hopefully um, we'll hear some of, uh, about some of the work, the very important work he's done um, for the Cambridge Law Faculty in Central Europe. Thank you, Andrew. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Can you hear me at the back? Yes. My wife says I have a very low voice. <laughs> and uh, because I'm coming back to the great subject of cells after a pretty good intermission, <laughs> that is, I left the job of director sometime in, oh, I think I know exactly when, uh, the Michaelmas term, 94. Uh, so, what I'm going to be doing is talking rather too much about myself. I quite like doing that once I get going. Um, but I will stick strictly to the 1994 boundary line, which is when Alan comes in. Off we go. In October 1990, I was appointed to an established professorship uh, of law in Cambridge University, and I was all set to carry out a normal pattern of academic activities, teaching legal propositions and researching into why they made up such an agglomeration of rules, procedures, other explications of English law or some other legal system or a branch of it. The post from which I was moving, which was a chair of English law in the law department of the London School of Economics, carried with it the expectation that I would strengthen understandings of what justified particular laws. I had books and articles to my credit, which the electoral board for my chair here thought showed, showed what I could do, or at least they judged me a better candidate for the job here than other applicants. A game was being played that could be won by a variety of strategies. In those days, the panel of electors to an established chair in Cambridge University might content themselves with a survey of each candidate's writings. For positions in the law faculty, these would not necessarily include a successful PhD thesis let alone an unsuccessful one, um, and or an, a, a, an interview face to face with the electoral board. I had neither of these qualifications to present anyway, but somehow I fitted the vision of the electoral board for what was known as the 1973 Professorship in Law. That's giving away a great deal. <laughs> Um, my contract with Cambridge, when finally the old schools, Senate House by more respectable terms, the old schools found a draft to send me uh, for my approval in, in employment matters. I was glad to accept. I would become responsible, so the document said, for delivering 16 lectures on legal subjects each year. My three main subjects were known to the world. The first was the newly constructed law of restitution, also known as, uh, not also known as, lost my place, unjust enrichment which I was already teaching in the London LLM as junior colleague to the great 
Lord Gough of Cheveley, who had written so splendidly on the subject. My second subject was the law of intellectual property, which I'd introduced as a novel LLM subject in London. And the third was the modern history of English law covering the period from early industrialization onwards, a matter that I considered trade lawyers in this country should have in their, as part of their cultural makeup. When I presented myself in Cambridge at the beginning of my tenure, it was plain enough that there was no really substantial gap for me to fill in the teaching and research provided by the law faculty other than in intellectual property. So I took to IP with a will, cooperating with others who were already contributing to that intriguing subject area. So let me turn to the foundation of cells itself. It seemed to me that there were two questions worth addressing uh, at, at this that's uh, what I'm supposed to be talking to you about, uh, which intensified with the dissipa dis 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 dissipation, disappearance of Cold War attitudes and politics at the very beginning of the 1990s. And the first question was, why was Cells designated a centre rather than, say, just an institute. And the second question was, why was it that I was asked to take charge of its creation, if only for some three or four years? May I say, to, to, within cell, cells, and I suspect I'm much to blame, historical records of where we got to from 1990 to 1994 were not very well collected and kept. Uh, Felicity, who's done so much to draw today's meeting together, undertook to search for whatever records we had and actually found some. So I have been reading letters to the members of the law faculty, which I guess I drafted, but they don't sound like anything special, uh, and have allowed quite some insight into what was going on, though rather at the level of titles and chapters and so forth. There's a need to do some more work on that if uh, if we are to keep a proper historical record, and we must do that. Anyway, I do acknowledge what she has done in just a few weeks. Tremendous. So my first question was, why a center, a rather grand and imposing and wide ranging word that you might choose for what the original team forming uh, a cells would have to th think about most definitely. Why a centre? Once the idea for a, a cells was sufficiently developed by those in, interested in setting up such a body, the university found the wherewithal to fund a chair of European law and an electoral board was appointed to fill it. Investigatory conversations with potential candidates began, in particular to inform the electoral committee for the chair. Equally, the university or funding bodies related to it, like the uh, uh, math mathematic uh, mathematics body so well founded uh, by Trinity 
and it was decided that four other more junior or short-term appointments would be made beneath the, uh, the chair when the appointment was made there. After, after all, uh, that produced a number of questions about what cells was to be. What attitudes and opinions should be shown by applicants, to, for the chair in particular, in order to sustain academic interest in the field? After all, it was just short of 15 years since the first common market referendum, as it was referred to then, had tested British opinion on the need to maintain the UK as a member state, which showed that two-thirds of those voting favoured staying in the European community. Those who wanted an institution where differing views about the communities could stand a reasonable chance of being heard, they were likely to support a grouping within a leading university. After all, opinion remained divided about the wisdom of the UK, remaining the, mem the member state that it had become by legislation in 1972. A different division of attitudes concerned the breadth of the subject matter that the centre would concentrate on. Should it be confined to European community law? Or did it also embrace comparative national and international law? What emphasis should be placed on the harmonisation of national laws or regional laws within member states? Some dozen or so members of the law faculty had shown considerable interest in a broad approach to such questions of scope. The expression European legal studies, which comes after CETA, was taken by many to indicate that the director and the management committee of CELS should handle differences of opinion about how far to stretch the topics on which conferences or lectures should take place and, importantly, the topics for research should be selected. behind plans for an institution that would acknowledge the striking course of years from 1990 onwards. Very exciting ones. The socialist states of the Cold War were no longer with us from 1990 on, onwards, at least not forever and today. Suddenly, the political freedoms of the West were more than a dream. West and East Germany, as we all remember, could come together as one federated territory that would rank as a crucial member state of the new Europe. For European legal studies, therefore, the appropriate designation that that was not just something informal and an, uh, an understanding of shared interests uh, which might solidify into close ties or equally might drift apart. The law teachers of Cambridge included distinguished scholars who were not given to building up separate entities with like-minded colleagues. A visitor might well ask a physical question and where is the cells? A respondent might point to the basement shell that was being built up, built upon, so as to provide what is now the David Williams Law Faculty building. David, I'm sure, sure, sure most of you know. David was the law fellow 
who became president of the university's Wolfson College for 12 years from 1980. He, he coupled this in 1990 to 92 with full-time vice-chancellorship of the University of Cambridge as a whole, and in the end was enabled to serve seven years as vice-chancellor in that office, which was the new period attaching to it for the whole future. It was vital for the setting up of cells that David was there to encourage its formation as only he could. That was equally true of the man who took over chairing the law faculty itself in the early 1990s, John Tiley, the tax law specialist who later we so sadly lost. Within a few years, there was undoubtedly a strong feeling that the university needed or deserved bodies devoting their research and commentary to what Europe, Europe was becoming, a project too substantial to be undertaken without acknowledgement of its role in the core of the university. Hence, the Centre for European Legal Studies expressed a widely held view that the institution should have in its remit the study of European law, whether this meant enactments or other legal expressions, binding acts of the European Community Council, Commission, Court of Justice. Its early summations of its work, that's Sell's work, which seemed to take the form of Christmas messages uh, at the end of the Michaelmas term. In both 1991 and 1992, included projects on the effects of the Maastricht Summit and the Social Charter, teaching European law to professional lawyers, programming lectures by emerging experts in the law of the European communities, who wanted to contribute their ideas through the faculty. There were larger scale meetings on difficult topics, such as, uh, such as the two day conference held with Trinity Hall on community law and national courts, rights and remedies. That had to wait, however, until 1994. So, pretty strong, positive uh, support was being shown from 1990 onwards without much contradiction uh, in this formative period. It was very strongly positive in, on my reading of the documents that still exist. So let me move on to my second question, which is, uh, why did I find myself being asked to take on the initial directorship of cells? My background for the task was rather hit and miss. True, I already had some appreciation of how to organise law and foreign language degrees for British students and students from a continental country over, over a four-year period instead of a three. As this, uh, and the, the foreign section being taken as the second or third year portion of that degree. And it would be a degree in law and languages. For years, I'd organized a summer course uh, mainly on English law for foreign law students in London. I'd become familiar with debates about the internal market freedoms for, for movement of goods and provision of services uh, and the impact of basic principles of community law in that sphere, particularly important, of course, for the wondrous world of intellectual property. 
Nonetheless, I was not a scholar with profound perceptions to impart either on European community law or upon comparative law for whatever purpose it might serve. The main answer to the question, why did, why did I become the first sales director, was indeed simple. Law teaching was, as, as it so often is, polymorphous, <coughs> And as delivered in Cambridge, it needed time and space to do it justice. In the 1980s, this seemed to have led to a view that Cambridge, the Cambridge LLM program could not be extended so as to offer lecture courses to graduate students that differed from European law, the, the, the European law subject in the undergraduate tripos. In my view, that called for reconsideration. Uh, somewhat surprisingly, I had already become chair of the faculty's LLM committee, uh, ably assisted by Pippa Rogerson, who was having coffee. <laughs> um, and so, being of like mind on the question of expanding European law subjects at the graduate level, within a year, uh, it was possible to persuade colleagues to put on more specific second level courses uh, in Europe, the European community as a new legal order competition law, and law and policy of the single European market. A director for cells who had taken a comparative law course and who arranged courses in foreign law at a continental faculty uh, where British students could pass a year with reciprocal exchanges of students coming from the other faculty. But most of all, I was taken to have the time, taken to have the time, to build up a proposed new centre on a considerable variety of subjects. When approached about getting cells underway, I said I would be glad to be involved, but that since the possibility of financing and filing a Cambridge University chair, chair in European law was becoming a reality. I did not wish to stand in the way of the new professor of European law, a post I had neither sufficient wit nor ability to fill. Alan Dashwood was the electoral board's choice as the European law professor. And he became free to accept the nomination in January 1995. However, he was prepared to take over the directorship of cells from the beginning of the previous Michaelmas term in, in 1994. So, in the end, label me what you will. A mere gap filler a better than nothing would be okay in the short term. By 1994, I was in the un unenviable position of needing to have both my hips replaced. So I wouldn't have been much good for anything in that period. Um, so Alan's willingness to take over cells and give it some real drive in advance of arrival for the European Law Chair was by then a huge relief to me. Cells was first acknowledged in university documentation as an institution for the future in May 1991 and in the next year and a half, its programs began to swell 
as it clearly had exploratory tasks that helped to give those who wanted to work at cells more than enough to do. It held many a chance to open doors, even when there were financial hurdles or too many people or places who were crowding in on the attractive opportunities. By 1993, the list of subjects being pursued by the new experts, either from, who came either from within or without uh, the, the uh, pro programs uh, of, of the law faculty, in lectures, seminars, and the writing of books and of theses. A spirit of c collaboration seemed to surround it and occasionally synchronisation could raise the odd difficulty. Still, the, D the David Williams building, where we all now are, was in course of being finished and was scheduled to provide cells with a home at last on part of its uppermost floor. Other specific things were happening uh, which took a lot of attention from those who were trying to run cells. In the opening of the university year in 1992, the university and the city of Cambridge became involved in organising a formal opening for cells. The Legal Affairs Committee of the European Parliament expressed their wish to visit the city and University of Cambridge for two days for which it had funding. Uh, this committee from the Legal Affairs, from, from the Parliament, uh, was in many ways, I think, equivalent to the House of Lords Subcommittee on European Law. There was work to be undertaken by them during this sojourn outside uh, normal sighting of community institutions. There was work to be undertaken by the committee itself some 16 of whose members were present here in Cambridge, and they had help from our teachers, notably Philip Allard, Christopher Greenwood, and Eleanor Sharp. The subjects centred around uh, topics the meaning of which deserved a lot of debate subsidiarity and proportionality, legal tools that could lead to interpretation of concepts that members of the Legal Affairs Committee of the EP might, pro might find useful as instruments of interpretation and policy formulation. The committee met in an old examination hall near King's College. It was not equipped to provide conference facilities that included interpretation into the various languages used by committee members. The most that could be done was to create equipment cells out of white cloth, from which I think I mean sheets, <laughs> uh, behind which the translators carried on their tasks. Much of the discussion was intensive and practical so perhaps not too much was lost by these surrounding circumstances. There were opportunities enough for politicians, national and local, and academics to continue conversations uh, uh, between and across themselves. Hospitality blossomed, cells itself provided worthwhile contributions, uh, an evening reception in the Senate House followed upon a concise and thoughtful lecture by Lord Slynn of Hadley entitled, What is a European 
community judge. You can read it in the 1993 volume of the Cambridge Law Review. Many people indeed must have read the lecture uh, since. Sells addicts began to appreciate that the centre could, after all, have a presence, though not perhaps quite yet at that point in time. Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, but Chancellor of Cambridge University, came up here to top out the structure of the David Williams building not completing it entirely, but it was standing, and it's still standing. Um, he lobbed a backhander in the direction of Lord Foster, the architect, by des describing the building as a good place for growing tomatoes. <laughs> <laughs> in the following year, he accompanied Her Majesty when she came finally to open the building as a whole, but that included recognising that Sells was already here, up in that nice corner. It was quite an in intriguing occasion because she in particular, I think, likes to talk to very small numbers of people as she goes round the reception. So there were points where the greatest professors, one or two, talked about uh, English common law, European law, international law in full, uh, at separate desks. But there was one that I've left out of the list, and it was labelled horse racing and the law. <laughs> and it was immensely popular. That bit of interviewing went on for some time. <laughs> um, and I think with that happening, one can say the first phase of Sells' life was a worthwhile occasion. One doesn't need to say more. Thank you.